you. Um, I'm applying for an STEM, NSF STEM grant from Muhlenberg College, which okay. mostly goes to scholarships. Um, and I was wondered if, wondering if there are possible tie-ins with the Skynet telescopes or either the Opus or um, MW curriculum. So uh, let me check here. NSF STEM. Yeah. Yes. TM. Uh, S hyphen STEM. Oh, okay. Or maybe just S S T E M. Scholarships in science, technology, and engineering. Yeah. So I'm I'm not super familiar with the program. Tell me a bit about it. I got the guidelines up here. Well, typically, um, NSF, uh, they want to attract, um, well, traditionally, it's uh, people from underrepresented groups. I don't know with the new Supreme Court ruling exactly how they pitch it now, mm -hmm. but um, but in some some sense, uh, students who are underrepresented get scholarships. So uh, for Muhlenberg, there's a variety of things we've been batting around. Um, we're building our own tiny little observatory and some of the other faculty and other disciplines are interested in maybe having a summer session before school starts where we support students who don't have as much background in um, say math and physics. And then, um, research opportunities, certain classes that are pitched to build up their confidence, things like that. Um, and so I was just wondering if there'd be any tie-in maybe with all of this stuff. Yeah, I think, I think so. So how does this differ from like an REU program? So what you're describing is a program for students to come in, but I, I guess these are- uh, It's more like- um, backgrounds. Like, yeah, it's more like it's going to be a continuous program to support the students. And uh, it's not exactly like an REU because it wouldn't be necessarily like summer research. The money can go to support them during the academic year and just all sorts of other kinds of scholarship money for them. They're pretty big grants as NSF grants go. Um, you know, I Yeah, think it looks like up to a million bucks for six years. And that's track yeah. one, track two, quarter million. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, so these are students uh, within your university, not students coming in over the summer. Well, they'd start in the, so we try to invite people. It might be that we invite people into the program. We ask for a short application, like a little essay. Then we choose the students who are going to be in a cohort. And then we support those students from maybe a couple months before they start until they graduate. Okay. And so then we build in a set of experiences that are going to expose them to different STEM topics, maybe get them excited about it and give them some um, grounding in areas where sometimes students without a lot of preparation have stumbled. And is it, um, how broad is it in STEM? Is it astro-focused or is it across all I, STEM disciplines? I think it's across all STEM disciplines. It used to be a little more narrow. Like I know at one point quantum computing was a big, mm -hmm. it was, you know, they'd focus on the areas they were putting a lot of other investment in. But I think in the most recent announcement, it's, it's broad. It could be, you know, any of the, um, you know, mathematical or physical sciences, I think are fine. Uh, this sounds great. I, I wasn't even aware of it. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can think of all sorts of ways to incorporate Skynet and uh, the Opus curriculum and um, the MWU curriculum in particular. This, this sounds like, uh, uh, yeah, and, and for the astronomy aspect, since it's broader than just astronomy, you're going to, uh, presumably you have partners in other STEM disciplines and you're all putting this in together. Uh, but on the astronomy side, yeah, uh, there is Opus, there's MWU. Uh, we could think about, um, uh, you know, the arriver program can only take a small number, but, you know, maybe, you know, some the top student or two could go to that. Um, and then you may have some more guided research experiences, uh, like in MWU where, you know, I showed you the HR diagram tool and we're moving towards that becoming a publishable experience. So you can imagine building things around that or any other kind of research topic as well, uh, tied to STEM. If you wanted to build into it, you could buy a big chunk of Skynet time 
on various telescopes. You know, in addition, you now the Opus comes with a little enough time to do the Opus curriculum, but you can imagine buying a block of time uh, to do whatever you can imagine. Okay, that sounds really interesting. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, we didn't meet last. That's right. I'm trying. So, uh, for those who just came in, I'm at Green Bank Observatory. Uh, got in kind of late. Didn't get much sleep. Totally unprepared. Uh, but um, it's my favorite place. I don't know if you can see um, now. The contrast is too high. But behind me, we have the Jansky antenna where multi-wavelength studies began um, in the 1930s, the first observation outside the visible band of uh, the center of the galaxy. And in the direction over there, we have the Green Bank Telescope. Let's see, I'm recording. I'll share my screen. Yeah, talk so I'm sure you've all seen pictures of the Green Bank Telescope before. And I'm actually passing on a, I had the opportunity to go on a tour, to go up to the top of the Green Bank Telescope right now, but I'm passing on that to meet with you all instead. So there's a measure of my dedication, but uh, I've been up there before, but it's, it's a fascinating telescope. I'm here with a colleague. Um, I'm here with Dave Moffat, and, but also a colleague from Tasmania who are building our back end systems um, for the new the new radio telescopes that we're integrating as part of the MW award. So three radio telescopes in Australia and um, um, uh, a number of telescopes in the US, to be determined number of telescopes in the US. He's building the back end signal processing units. He happened to be in Florida for a workshop, radio astronomy workshop. So came up to UNC and worked with my team for a few days, and now we brought him to Green Bank. And so he's up on the GBT right now. So, you know, bigger than the Statue of Liberty, almost the size of the Washington Monument. 2,000 panels that are, um, it's an active optic surface. So every time they move, those panels adjust to restore the perfect parabolic shape. Has two elevators. Um, it's off axis. So think of a telescope. I think of a dish that would come all the way over to here. I am sharing. Yep. Uh, so about 600 uh, across, but they only built this piece. So the radio waves come down, bounce off axis. So this structure does not, um, um, block the, the aperture and cause diffraction. It's uh, and then it bounces up, hits the sub reflector, goes into this room. And this room is like a full size room. You know, you can have many people in there and it has a wide variety of receivers. Rides around on this track. These beds of wheels are the size of city buses. So it's just very, very cool piece of instrumentation. Which is not on Skynet and won't be on Skynet. Anyway, it's right. I can see it out the window there. Anyway, uh, so let's see. Last week, was it last week? No, last week we did meet, right? It was two weeks we ago. That we, we met. Okay. Um, questions about anything or how are things going with you all in, in your implementations? Remind me again, who all's doing? I know um, UNCA, you're, doing, you're implementing this semester, right? And Ian, I know you're implementing this semester. We're near the end. Well, we're getting near the end of the semester. How are things going? What labs are you at? How's it going? Any questions I can answer? Dan, I have a really quick, boring question about grading. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned the little calculator symbol and what that means. Yes. And um, and I noticed in the grading guide, it says add those points back in. So, you know, I keep my own grades and upload them to Moodle. But is there a way to actually add them back in on WebAssign so that their WebAssign grade agrees with my grade? Right. Uh, there, if not, it's okay. I'm just curious yeah, if I miss something. Yeah, this is, this is one of the things that's really kind of frustrated me with WebAssign. They have made a decision to, 
uh, have this calculator symbol, which means the student did the calculation correct. It's just based on incorrect inputs, but they, they've also made the decision that it's worth zero points. So uh, to add the points back in, what my TAs do is they, um, they, they go to the, like the nearest sign your name box or the nearest box where you have flexibility to change the points and just add it there, maybe add a comment. Okay. And can you, so if that box is worth two points, could you like put in four points? Will it? Yep. Yeah. It'll let you put in more than the max. Yeah. Okay. I thought of that, but I didn't think I could yeah. do greater than. Okay, great. Thank it's a little half-assed approach, but it works. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had one other quick question. Um, I think you have, um, the MWU stuff looks pretty awesome. And thank you for showing us that HR diagram. I mean, Opus is too. Yeah. Some of you have you opened up that document and you dove into it and you're, you're trying some of the, the exercises already. So that's wonderful. And so um, where is, we, we've seen some of it piecemeal, but I think you showed us, um, I think you shared with us the entire curriculum as you have it to now. Is that true or not? Yes. I sent around, uh, I think. Is that in that report? It it's in that report. We have links to all the awesome docs. Okay. I thought that's where I'd seen it. Yeah, Great. let me pull it up just for everyone who wants to. Down. Because I've sort of been playing around with um with doing some color images myself, which is really fun. And then realized you probably had good recommendations of um exposure times and everything I should also be paying attention to. Yeah, for some things we do, for other things we teach the students how to do a test observation. You know, uh, for some of the astrophotography, you know, in Opus, we say put it in on any particular telescope. But um, um, for uh, MWU astrophotography, it's often designed around a specific telescope. You have right. a particular field of, view, uh, field of view that you're working with to capture whatever you're trying to frame up. And so you kind of pick a telescope in that case. And... Um, and so, uh, you know, we don't have sample exposure times for everything uh, yet. Uh, in Skynet 2, there will be an exposure time calculator that will help tremendously. You'll say, okay, the brightest thing in this field is this. If you don't want to saturate it, this is recommended exposure time. But the current instructions, once you get into the astrophotography, which is the serious astrophotography, which is mo module three, they run you through it, the students through a test observation. Got it. Yep. And then you rescale based upon the brightness of the brightest stars in the field. Yeah, the astrophotography gets pretty serious and in-depth once you get into module three. And so that one has a bit of a learning curve and it often takes our students like a month to get through that one. They're doing other things at the same time. But once you have that skill set, it opens up the rest of the curriculum. And, you know, Great, thank you. You can do some cool things. Other feedback, questions? Okay. Um, yeah, I did have one, Dan. Um, with regard to the graphing tool that you use for like period folding and everything. Yes. I know there's a link in there that takes you to like Skynet Astro 101. Yeah. Is, is there a link somewhere in, um, uh, you know, like uh, Afterglow that will take you to that? Or do you just have to go? You just have to go here. Um, so currently the lab's linked to this thing. It, you know, it's this nondescript address, and then we have right. a redirect page. And right, the old tools the are, you know, under some, you know, weird address, but all the new tools are under astromancer.skynet.unc.edu. The name of the collection, my students decide to call it the Astromancer collection of uh, tools. They, okay. they most of them. Okay. Uh, just one other simple question, um, sure. and it's not a major deal, but is there a, like a, a little cheat sheet for uh, some of the changes that have been made? Like, you know, the videos send you to the little ruler icon, and uh, that ruler's icon's not there anymore. Yeah, some of the videos I need to update. Normally, I, I keep on top of this, but the MWU development has put a hold on corrections to the Opus videos and things. Yeah, I, I'm not being critical. Um, no, I'm just curious if there was like a little cheat sheet that said, oh, by the way, this has moved here. This has moved here. This has moved here. No, unfortunately not. I just need to reshoot the videos. 
I should also say for those of you who are diving into MWU activities, uh, we redesigned a lot of the um, afterglow color combination stuff uh, when we were doing module three, I was doing it with the students. I was not happy with it. It wasn't working as I was hoping. And so some stuff changed in particular sources. Let me bring up an image. Uh, the source tab and the photometry tab got split. And so there may be some confusion, particularly as you're working through MW modules one and two, though I'll be up updating those very soon because I'm teaching MW in the spring. And those MW modules will move to a press book format and I'll start shooting some videos. But yeah, there is um, there used to be a ruler icon here and uh, we did an upgrade of the the um, uh, angular angular framework and it no longer had that ruler icon and it just turned out to be a pain so it turned into a graphing icon. I try to make notes um, either in the text um, or a little, sometimes I write a note at the bottom of the video, though I haven't caught up with all the small changes. That's fine. Yeah, it's coming. Once I get through this last MW push, um, there'll be a big overhaul on Opus. Though I have made some progress on Opus um, Lab 9 over the past week. And so I'll show you some of that stuff um, now, I think. So are you planning on doing an uh, overhaul for spring 2024 or? Uh, well, the plan was to do that. I'm hoping to get a few more things submitted. It won't be a complete overhaul. So I've run out of time and I got to get back to the MW overhaul. That's fine. I'm, we just will be using it a little more widely in spring 24. So I didn't know if I, I need to just create like a little cheat sheet or something. Yeah. I, I can do that. It's not a problem. There are probably only half a dozen things uh, yeah. in Opus. And so, yeah, if you produce a cheat sheet and if you share it with the rest of the group, that would be great as well. Uh, I'll be glad to. I'm not sure I can get that done like in the next week, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Some of these things that as you'll encounter them as you encounter them. And and I can if there are any if there's any confusion, I can help resolve it there, too. Uh, sorry to derail you. Thanks. No, no, that's OK. I'm really just procrastinating because I, I got in. As I said, I got in late to Green Bank, didn't get much sleep, and I'm totally unprepared. So but no more procrastinating. We're going to dive in here. Do you have to do that in the computer lab at Green Bank? Oh, I'm in, in the Drake, room? I'm in the Drake Lounge right now. Oh, OK. Yeah, which is hey, I've already said Green Bank's my favorite place on Earth. This room is my favorite room, my absolute place on Earth. Um, my summer program, I, before they built the Green Bank Telescope and the new Science Center, would run it out of this room for about a decade. And all, and all the um, all the residence hall rooms are here. We'd wire them all up with Ethernet cables because you can't do anything wireless. And um, anyway, here we go. Lab eight. I'm looking at my notes here. Let's see. Now, uh, just the. Review I did, I did post uh, lab seven, so it is here and I'll post lab eight after this. And uh, I think I think we'll meet one more time, not next week, next week's right before Thanksgiving, uh, but lab nine should be completely done, not in the web assigned environment, but completely written. I have it about two thirds written at this point. And so we'll meet one more time in two weeks to go over lab nine. So there'll be another unit here, uh, you know, if you want to. Let's see. So web assign that's logged out, but I think I have it open down here. This one. Yeah, lab eight. OK, so standard beginning. Uh, we have the three, you know, the standard videos. They're also included, you know, on the YouTube site. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's a great <laughs> that was great capture on the great capture. Still no. frame. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, no one. Oops, one second. You know, here we are. There will eventually be a ninth one here. We view the playlist, and of course, it, it captures three frames. And I always and they always look like a dork in all three of them, so that's the best one from that one. Uh, but uh, the introduction video, the background procedure, there's only one detailed how-to video. Uh, it's using one of the Astromancer tools. And but there's also the equipment video here. OK, 
Okay, back to the, not that one. Not that one. I have too many tabs open, too much stuff going on. I tried that one. Oh, no, it is that one. I just moved it out of the way. Okay. So your standard video is plus the equipment video. And uh, right now it says there are no observations. You know, if you go to the observation planner, it says there are no observations for lab nine, um, but there will be. I'll just briefly, I won't show the observation now. I think um, I'll just give you kind of a, a very quick preview as to what lab nine's shaping up to be. But I'll save the placing the observation for two weeks from now because I bet a bunch of the other Opus instructors come in because they've been waiting for this capstone unit. Uh, so in Lab 9, they're going to measure Hubble's constant. So in, uh, to see how they all fit together, Lab 5, they learn standard candles, R. Lyrae, Cepheids, Type 1As. In Lab 6, they use the R. Lyrae's and the Cepheids to do the Great Debate of 1920. In Lab 7, they learned some radio stuff, how to take a radio spectrum um, and learn what a Doppler shift is. They do the rotation curve of the Milky Way, touch on dark matter. Lab 8, which we'll do today, um, is one of the non-Skynet labs. It's one of the manual labs designed to correct a misconception and get to that. But it teaches about the true nature of the expansion of the universe. A lot of students have the wrong idea, so it's meant to correct that. Um, and Hubble's law. And so they, they really become intimately familiar with Hubble's law. And we always had this intention to have a capstone unit to measure Hubble's constant and, and the age of the universe. If you have Hubble's constant, you can invert it. It approximates the age of the universe. And, I, and for the longest time, I couldn't figure out how to do this with standard cosmic distance ladder stuff. And so my plan was to do it with... Um, have a gravitational wave event approach using standard siren and we have now built that tool it took years to build that tool where we can take ligo data off the ligo website put it into one of our soon to be on the astromancer site tools and you can model the gravitational wave stuff and technically you can measure the distance to these and i was going to use that but it's sufficiently complicated. It fits better in MWU as the black hole unit. And as I was doing module six of MWU, I, I realized that I can actually do a measurement of Hubble's constant standard cosmic distance ladder technique using radio spectra. So it's all going to tie in uh, five, six, seven, and eight. So the idea is they're going to collect radio spectroscopy of nearby spiral galaxies, and you can measure the redshift of the hydrogen line, just like we saw the hydrogen line in the Milky Way. Now I'll slide down and show you. A little bit down here. You know, in lab seven, they learned how to take spectra like this. Here's the hydrogen line of the Milky Way. Uh, this is actually a five minute integration on M83. And you can barely see it, that little bump there is uh, the cold hydrogen in M83. And so you have to do something called on-off spectroscopy, not just on, where you can easily see the Milky Way's line, but not the other lines. You image, or you get a spectrum, and then you go off source by about two degrees, you do it again, it's not there. And then you do on minus off divided by off, and it takes out all the modulation in the background spectrum, it cancels out much of the H1. It's not perfect, but there the hydrogen line of the distant, more distant galaxy comes out. And there's only about five of these that you can actually get the line within about a minute or two of, of observing. I don't want to eat up too much of their time. And well, there's, there's six or seven, but a couple are in the Virgo cluster. And those are getting tugged on by the other galaxies too much to use to measure Hubble's constant. But I tested all these and you can get a redshift. And based upon the distance, say from a Cepheid or a Type 1a in there, you can get Hubble's constant, and they all come out to be in the high 60s, low 70s. Uh, I was surprised by how accurate it was. And so Lab 9, they're going to measure Hubble's constant using cosmic distance ladder techniques. We'll give them a, a Cepheid or a Type 1a like we do in Lab 6. Mm -hmm. And then the ratio is Hubble's constant. But also there's going to be a bit where they uh, learn a bit 
learn about the cosmic microwave background. And in the CMB, the si there's a typical clumping size, and I'll explain more of this in uh, two weeks. But that typical clumping size is proportional to Hubble's constant. And they also measure Hubble's constant from the CMB, and that's a, a huge source of debate right now uh, in cosmology. It's called the, the tension between the CMB measurements and actually all measurements of Hubble's constant and the cosmic distance ladder, which is done in the local universe with the, the type 1a supernovae. Uh, they differ by about six kilometers per second. One, uh, the ones in the high 60s, ones in the low 70s. But the error bars have shrunk so much that they are five, six sigma discrepant from each other. And so there's something amiss, either with probably the cosmic distance ladder calibration or with our understanding of physics. I hope it's the latter. That would be more interesting. But uh, that's going to be our capstone lab. We're going to measure Hubble's constant two ways. Uh, the cosmic distance ladder way makes use of everything they've learned in recent labs, and they'll learn a little bit about this interesting tension. Okay, so more on that in two weeks, but I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, questions, thoughts? All right, let's dive into this one. So this is lab eight. Uh, as I was saying, the goal is to understand uh, the nature of the expansion. Um, the name kind of causes confusion. This has never, you know, so it's been debated, you know, for, you know, go back to the 60s and there was a big debate between um, advocates of the Big Bang model and advocates of the steady state model. And Fred Hoyle, was an advocate of the steady state model where the universe has been here forever. And uh, he is the one who named the Big Bang model. It's meant to be kind of a derogatory term to put the model down. And back then it really was a, a model, you know, you know, a theory, the Big Bang. And it wasn't, a you know, theory is the term I meant to use. It really was a theory in the truest sense that, you know, it could be right, could be wrong. Now I'd describe it more as a working model. There's so much evidence in favor of it. And we just hit the tip of the iceberg here. Um, there's more with the CMB and there's other things, you know, I just can't get to in this lab, but hopefully through teaching uh, the Big Bang in your courses, you hit many of these things. I'd describe it not just as a working model, but as a very good working model. And that's something students don't necessarily appreciate either. But anyway, the student's misconception, you know, they're, they're not in their mind debating steady state versus Big Bang, that's settled. But um, the name Big Bang gives this idea that, you know, in the beginning, uh, you had empty space. Space was there and it was vast, maybe infinite, but totally empty except all the mass and energy concentrated in one spot and then something happened and exploded, expanding into the void. And that is not what the Big Bang theory is and that's easily shown uh, that would result in things that we do not see. And, and we go through some of that here. So the point of this is to give, although they like the Skynet labs, they collect their own data, they feel data ownership. Uh, sometimes they like to break it up with the manual labs, like in lab two, if you do the globe and lights, you know, it's very manual. In the parallax lab, they go out and they actually measure some things manually. And this is also a manual lab that's intended to convey the true nature of the expansion. Okay, hopping down, let's look at the goals here. This is another lab where we couldn't fit it all in one question. And you'll see as I expanded these, it's very easy to miss either section C or forget about uh, you know, section D, procedure D here. So make sure the students do the whole thing. So goals, um, first goal is Learn that the Big Bang was not an explosion in space, but an explosion of space. I, I like that phrase, even though it's a little bit cutesy in the end. Space really isn't exploding. It's just expanding rapidly. It's, you know, it's an expansion of space, but not an explosion in space, an, exp an expansion of space. Um, and then when you do this, you get Hubble's law, and they see that all the galaxies, except the really close galaxies, like in our local group, all the galaxies are moving away from us. The farther away they are, the faster they're moving. And they look at Hubble's law and they say, oh, 
uh, we're at the center of things. And that goes against the whole point of the Our Place in Space curriculum. Now, we taught them early on um, in Lab 3 with the Venusian phases that we live in a heliocentric universe, not a geocentric one. Uh, moving forward to Lab 6 with the Great Debate, that our sun is not the center of the galaxy, our galaxy is not the primary galaxy in the universe. And then we get here to cosmology, and it would be a, a, a real shame if they produce Hubble's law from their little rubber band universe and walk away with the conclusion, oh, we are at the center of the expansion. And, and so you know, goal two is to show that at, it doesn't matter where you are, everyone sees everyone moving away from that location, and the farther away it is, the faster it's moving. And then finally, we dive into, we, we do all parts one and two with constant expansion. In part three, we dive into a uh, decelerating and accelerating scenario. And, and they will, they basically using their rubber band and measurements and godlike powers to stop time and carry out their measurements and then jump forward in time. They produce Hubble's laws and they'll do it for a constant expansion, but also decelerating and accelerating then they compare it to the type 1a supernova data and see that we live in an accelerating universe. And so dark energy is the carrot here. And just so everyone, I know you all know this, the definition of dark energy is that which causes this observed acceleration. We have no idea what it is, of course. Okay, equipment, we talked about all this stuff last time. Uh, so no need to go through it again now. Just if you're doing this in class, it's your responsibility to make sure you have the supplies. But again, they're very inexpensive. Background. Okay, so the background's a little bit hefty. If you're teaching um, uh, a lecture section, you probably want to cover some of this in lecture. If not, you just have a, a heftier uh, pre-lab. It's not a lot. Like in Lab 7, it's a lot of background. As, as, we, as we were saying, the trade-off with Lab 7 is the execution part is really easy. Here it's not a lot, but it's just mind-bending, mind-blowing stuff. So you may have to go at some pace. Uh, so Hubble's Law, it's a plot of distance on the x-axis. I know you know these things. I'm just going to, you know, as you might to a student, but a little bit faster. And on the y-axis, often we plot speed. And I write here apparent recessional speed, the key Recessional just means everything's moving away, but the key word is apparent. Um, when this, you know, each one of these points here is a galaxy and you, know, you get a spectrum and you measure a redshift. And then if you interpret it as a Doppler redshift, a motion through space, you multiply by C and you have a velocity. And that's often what's plot, plotted here. But they're making an assumption that it is a Doppler motion. And that's not the case. And we'll We'll show that here. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And a little bit later down, I, I have the same plot with what you should actually be plotting here. It's cosmological redshift. But we have to define what that is. And we've already explained Doppler redshift, so we have something we can explain it against. But anyway, distance versus redshift. Distances, we learned how to do that in lab five um, using for galaxies, Cepheids, and type 1As. So an expansion of that. And in lab seven, we learned how to me measure redshifts. So this is tying into things that have happened before. And here's just a reminder of the equation for redshifts. Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, you know, for the Doppler equation, V is just C times Z, where Z is the change in wavelength divided by the emitted wavelength. Okay. And so again, here we have Hubble's law, and it's showing everything's moving away from us. It's not everything, as I said, nearby stuff, uh, like stuff in our local group is gravitationally bound. Andromeda is moving towards us. In fact, it's going to collide with us in three billion years or so. Um, but beyond the local group, this flow dominates. Now, you can see, you know, it's not, per it's not perfect. The scatter here is not measurement error. Um, it's it's actually true physical scatter, and that is due to gravitational motions between galaxies and nearby galaxies. So there's a little bit of scatter due to actual gravitational tugs, Doppler motions uh, superimposed on the Hubble flow. But the trend is quite clear, even with relatively nearby galaxies. 
And th these data are probably genuine. It's a bit of a cartoon plot, but probably based on real data. Pull out of a textbook and then remade it uh, to not violate copyright uh, rules. Okay, so let's focus on the farther away, the faster it's moving. So let's run time backwards. If something's nearby, it's moving away slowly. Running time backwards, it's coming back at us slowly. The stuff that's far away, it would be coming back at us quickly. And if it's a linear relationship, it means all that stuff is back at us at a common time. So if you run the clock backwards, everything is on top of everything else. Um, it, you know, it doesn't mean there's a single point in the universe with all the matter. Uh, we'll get to that subtlety in a second, but you know, the densities are infinite. And then you run time forward and everything is expanding away. And, you know, so it gives you the feeling, the sense um, of an explosion. But very few explosions give you this kind of pattern with, you know, a range of velocities. Uh, normally, if you have an explosion, most things leave the area with a particular velocity or maybe a small range of velocities, but not like this kind of uniform distribution of velocities. So this would be a very strange explosion. What we would instead expect is a shell in space. And uh, we've now looked out there with galaxy redshift surveys. Here's just an example. This is kind of a fun plot for the students when you point out that every single blue dot is a galaxy. So we're now getting to very large scales. Um, it is not a shell. Now we do see a number of things in here and there's some subtleties that need to be understood. Uh, we do see some structure. It does clump on small enough scales, and that's due to local gravity pulling things together. It can even sometimes give hints of shells, but that's just because it pulls itself together, not just into points, but walls and, and sheets and things like this. And this is just one slice. We've done this, of course, three-dimensionally. This is one slice and the slice in the opposite direction. Once you look at areas bigger than kind of what I'm indicating with my cursor, the density is pretty uniform. Now you may say, as I move farther away, the density is dropping off, and that's not because we're running out of galaxies, we're just running out of sensitivity. Our instruments are not sensitive enough to see the galaxies this far away, and so the numbers drop off. But we understand the sensitivity of our telescopes very well, and you correct for that, and we find that it stays uniform as far out as we can see. And that's homogeneity. The universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Back in the 60s, they had to assume these things, but now we can measure it. And of course, you need to define, define the terms. Homogeneity means the same number of all locations. Once you correct for that sensitivity based drop off, that's what we see. Once you get bigger than the gravitational clumping scale. And isotropic means the same numbers in all directions. The universe had an edge. We were close to the edge. We'd see more galaxies in one direction than the other. It's not the case. So it's and we see the same gal numbers of galaxies in all directions. So it's homogeneous and isotropic, the cosmological principle. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Check in my notes because, as I've already confessed, I'm wildly unprepared today. Okay, that's good. So no shell. So that kind of works against question, the question. Quick question, please. Please. When yeah, when we have a. Uh, God, when the world universe is expanding, then in principle, that density should be smaller and smaller. So is it quite, uh, is it quite, uh, I mean, the time is quite large to have that density reduced due, due to the expansion. I mean, if any matter, matter expanses, expanses, then it will, its density will reduce yes. I mean, in the smaller scale. But yeah. Yep, the density is, you know, the overall density is dropping uh, throughout the expansion. Uh, you know, this is not in the lab, but as you're teaching this, you have these different eras. Uh, you have the matter-dominated era, where the density is higher en high enough that the, the matter is determining what's going on. Even before that, you have the radiation-dominated era. But we're, we are now late enough into the expansion. The density is so low, it's the dark energy that dominates. And so we've gone from a universe that was decelerating to one that's accelerating, and that's something the students will learn. Okay, let me give you another uh, reason here that you can try with your students. So here's, of course, the Hubble Deep Field, uh, thousands upon thousands of galaxies and redshifts for, you know, 
most of them here, this is just a small sampling where the redshift has been marked. And you can see there are a bunch of them greater than one. Now, this is a little bit of a hand wavy cheat. I do explain the, the full thing here, but I've never had a student smart enough to catch me on this. It is written here, though. So uh, if you go back to our Doppler equation, which many of you know does not hold uh, as you approach the speed of light, but just looking at this equation, if you have a redshift greater than one, it applies a speed greater than one, uh, greater than C. And if there's one, only one piece of modern physics your students know, it's that you can't go faster than the speed of light. And so if these were Doppler redshifts, they would indicate motion faster than the speed of light by this equation. Okay, so again, that's another argument that this is not a motion through space. Now, technically, for the if you encounter the one smart student that I never have, they may come up and say, well, Professor so-and-so, uh, this equation is actually an approximation. And once you get near the speed of light, you need to use the relativistic Doppler equation. And the way the relativistic Doppler equation works is um, if you have a redshift greater than one, it doesn't mean you're moving faster than the speed of light. It means you're moving very close to the speed of light. And if you're moving very close to the speed of light, you'll have all the special relativistic effects kick in, time dilation. If we saw one of these, if we looked at and found a variable star in one of these galaxies, it would be varying way too slow. Supernovae would be evolving way too slow. We don't see that. You get length contraction along the direction of motion. But these are all moving away from us. We wouldn't see that. But you get uh, mass increase as well. So the galaxies would be way more massive and they would have gravitational influence on their surroundings. So, yeah, if you do have the smart student who says that's not the right equation when you're close to the speed of light. Um, correct. But you would have all the special relativistic effects and they're not seen. So that's another piece of evidence that this is not a Doppler redshift. This is not motion through space. And I, I give a little personal account. Uh, Josh, who's our lead programmer now for Skynet, when he was an undergrad, and I, and I mentioned this in the first lab, uh, just to get them excited that they're using the same telescopes that are making interesting discoveries. We, we've seen a galaxy moving 600% the speed of light away from us, but it's not moving th through space faster than the speed of light. Something else is going on. So what is going on? And that is space itself is expanding. This is what Einstein, his field equations taught us. Yeah, of course, you get motion through space, but space itself can expand like a rubber sheet. And there are different ways to visualize this. And let me walk you through some of them. You've seen, again, you've seen lots of these things. But here's the two-dimensional analogy. So go down one dimension. Sometimes it's hard to think of the expansion of 3D space. What's it expanding into? So go, start by going down one dimension. Here you see galaxies kind of painted on a rubber sheet. Imagine grabbing the edges of the sheet and everyone expanding it, the galaxies are pulled apart from each other. They're not moving across the sheet. They're not moving through space, but they're being pulled apart because of the expansion of space. Um, that's, you can go a dimension up. I'm gonna add this figure to the paper eventually. Um, I didn't initially because, I don't know why I didn't initially. Yeah, I'd have to certainly pay to get this remade, but this is the standard raisin bun analogy. So here we have three-dimensional space with um, <laughs> some amazing baker who placed the raisins on a perfect grid. And without the perfect grid, you wouldn't be able to see the effect in a two-dimensional picture. But as you put the bun in the oven, as the bread, which is, represents space, expands, the raisins are pulled apart from each other. Each raisin is moving apart from all the others. Now, of course, this loaf of raisin bread has edges. This is not an isotropic universe. You would have to imagine an infinite loaf, infinitely large loaf of raisin bread. And that's technically one of the mathematically allowed solutions. I personally am offended by the concept of physical infinities. But I mean, that's just me. I, I, I don't believe in physical infinities. Um, if I were God, uh, I would be ashamed if I invented a universe with physical infinities, because it's very inefficient. Uh, I, I value efficiency above all. If the universe were infinite, that means how many? There are eight of us in this Zoom meeting. Somewhere else in the universe, there are eight people exactly like us with our same histories having this exact same meeting. In fact, not just once, an infinite number of times. And that seems wasteful. If I were God, I think I could do better than that. But... Anyway, um, I'm not a fan of per, uh, physical infinities. Uh, 
mathematically loud solution, but Einstein also gives us a, a solution. Space can bend around on itself like the surface of the Earth bends around on itself. You can't visualize that with three-dimensional space because it would be embedded in four dimensions, bending around, and no one can envision four dimensions. Except Hawking, Hawking uh, said he was able to envision four dimensions for about 15 minutes. Uh, so take it or leave it. Um, <laughs> I tend to leave it because my college roommate also said uh, he could envision four-dimensional space, but he was high at the time. So it makes me wonder wonder what Hawking was smoking. But anyway, you can use that as a joke in your class if you want. Um, a little risky, I guess. I don't know. Risque. Uh, but here's the analogy one dimension down again, like the surface of a balloon with coins taped on it. The coins represent the galaxy. As you blow up the balloon, the, co the coins move apart. The universe is the surface. The inside and the outside is not part of the universe that's an embedding dimension and whether embedding even if it is curved like this whether embedding dimensions even exist is questionable it could be more like a, a computer game where in, in numerical simulations professional numerical simulations work this way where you go off one side of the screen you come in the other you go off the front you come in the back you go off the top you come in the bottom you know perhaps the universe is like a simulation that structure is numerically the same as or kind of this wraparound universe. It's um, finite, but without bound. All sorts of interesting topology that's kind of beyond the survey level. You close and reopen because it looked like I was missing a little bit at the bottom. Yeah. So just in conclusion, the Big Bang is better described not as an explosion in space, but an explosion of space. Quick question. Yeah. When the objects, uh, when the space is expanding, then is that uh, force, let's say uh, that force is uh, larger than the gravitational force, then the, that will tear apart galaxies and so on. Is it not that high? Um, yeah, so uh, fortunately, um, like we're not expanding with the universe. So think of Hubble's law. It becomes stronger at greater distance. And, 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 and so very small distances like the scale of me, I'm not expanding with the universe because my intermolecular bonds are stronger. Well, I know I look at my waistline. Maybe I am a little bit expanding with time. Happens with age. It happens to the best of us. But um, um, planets, galaxies, groups of galaxies, the gravity is strong enough to overcome the expansion. But gravity drops as one over distance squared. Hubble's law increases in proportion to the distance. So once you get outside the local group, out beyond Andromeda, uh, the Hubble flow wins. Okay, here's the other background thing. Uh, okay, so we've established it's not a Doppler shift. It's not motion through space. Yeah, motion through space is going on, but it's sublight speed. It's not a big deal compared to this. But we're still measuring redshifts. If it's not motion through space, where are these redshifts coming from? And so we call these cosmological redshifts. It's emitting this light, and the light has no internal cohesion. As I was just saying, I have internal cohesion. The planet, the, gal the solar system, the galaxy, our local group of galaxy, we have internal cohesion. We can hold ourselves together against the expansion. Light waves can't. No internal cohesion. As the universe spans, they, they expand. And the wavelengths get longer, so they're redder, and uh, so we that's a redshift. Compared to the original, the emitted wavelength, it's now longer, and you can mistakenly interpret it as it is a Doppler shift, but you'll end up with things like motion faster than the speed of light. Uh, it's a cosmological redshift. So once you understand that, this is actually Hubble's law, distance versus cosmological redshift. The scatter on top of here is Doppler redshift. Okay. And then we just give kind of a nice summary, starting in lab two, where we measured the size of the Earth. And then we used that for Earth baseline parallax, got the AU, used the AU for stellar parallax, got out to our Lyries and Cepheids, figured out their standard candles, used them farther out, calibrated type 1a supernovae. And now the final rung of the distance ladder is Hubble's law, because once you have Hubble's law determined, you can go farther out, just measure the galaxy's redshift, just take a spectrum, find some lines, measure how redshifted they are, you come across, you come down, you know the distance. 
So this is the ultimate cap of the cosmic distance ladder. Dan, can I ask yeah. you a question regarding the discussion you were having earlier? Um, so since this is cosmological redshift and not um, uh, Doppler, uh, relativistic Doppler shift, so the formula that we have them use is correct, right? And then the the relativistic, the special relativity, relativistic Doppler shift would be an incorrect formula to apply to this case. Is that right? So the the redshift part of the equation, delta lambda over lambda, is correct. Yeah. If you want to convert that to a velocity, multiplying by c is only correct at low redshifts. Um, um, at high redshifts close to one, then you need a different equation. But it wouldn't, that different equation would be some general relativistic equation. It wouldn't be the special relativity. It would be the special relativistic. It would. Yeah. For if, if you want to interpret a high redshift as Doppler motion, that's special relativistic. Independent of, you know, expansion of the universe, if you just have a very high redshift and you know it's due to motion, no, no, that's thinking. not that's not what okay. I'm asking. I'm okay. saying we know it's due to expansion. Yeah, so it isn't due to um, relative motion. Yeah, and so we we do not need. Um, okay, I see what you're saying. It's the same kind of answer, actually. Um, you don't need a fancy equation. Uh, you just Hubble's law is sufficient in the local universe. The farther out you go, you'll start to see curvature effects. Uh, due to dark energy, how much dark matter there is, et cetera. And they're they're going to touch this by the end of the lab. Okay. But yeah. And this will really be the case in lab nine. If you want to go all the way back to the CMB, Hubble's, the standard linear Hubble's law does not cut it. Um, and so I have to do some simplifications there. But let's get into the lab. I apologize. I, I just dilly-dallied starting because my I just started drinking my coffee. My brain wasn't firing, so I've wasted some time. I may go a couple minutes over. If you have to leave, totally understood. Uh, you can check out the video. So this is how we do it. Um, we're going to use just a one-dimensional piece of the universe, a rubber band. As I said, you got to get the right kind of rubber band that when you cut it, it's 18 centimeters. You don't want it too thin or cheaply made such that the density is varying so you get non-uniform expansion. But, you know, a pretty standard rubber band. They'll cut it open, put it on a ruler, and they'll mark it 3, 6, 9, 12, and 15. Now, I usually have it, but since I'm at Green Bank, I left my, my one-dimensional universe at home. I've misplaced a whole universe. I, for, I forgot a whole universe. I'm ashamed. But um, you, you can imagine a stretching rubber band. So we have five evenly placed galaxies. It's like our five... It's like the evenly placed raisins in the bun. And um, and they should just test it out. Um, here it is at the kind of the resting position. They're going to be 12 centimeters from galaxy one to five. And then stretch it all the way out to 27. That's the most that we'll ask them. And they put the push pins in. If they go through your foam board, you just pull the foam board out so the pins go across the lip of the table so you can go all the way through. You don't want to have them not go all the way in because they'll fly out. And you want to put them in at an opposing angle or else they can fly out and you'll have sharp objects flying across the room. Uh, you may want to consider goggles. I haven't gone that far yet, but uh, you might want to. Okay, procedure B, Hubble's Law. This one's a little lengthy, but after you know how to do this, uh, the rest is pretty easy. So um, what we have is this is time in minutes, though it's arbitrary. Since they've got like powers, they can stop time, do their measurements, restart time. But I just put it in a unit that's familiar. Let's say it's minutes. And this is the distance between galaxy one and galaxy five that they're going to set. And you can imagine them doing in real time. Some student very slowly expanding the rubber band three centimeters per minute, and they rapidly do their measurements. But since they have the godlike powers, they can stop time and do their measurements. So here's... We're going to measure the distance from galaxy zero to the other galaxies, and we're going to position galaxy five um, based upon this. We actually have them start before they do any of this. Just plot the distance between galaxy one and five versus time. And let's see, I need to get into answer key mode. The tables will get a little messier, but you'll see all the figures.
Oh, I guess I have to log into Cengage to get into answer key mode. So one sec. Fresh copy. Sure, I'm showing all. Yeah, I'm in answer key mode now. Okay. So, you know, it's messier in answer key mode. Uh, first, we just have them plot the distance between those two galaxies versus time uh, using the simple curve tool that they used in lab two. And yep, that's a constant expansion, linear. Then we have them stretch the rubber band. We can't do these early ones because the rubber band would actually have to shrink and it doesn't do that, so we skip those. Uh, but here's zero to 12, the resting state, zero to 15, zero to 18, and they measure the distance from galaxy one to each of the galaxies. Now your smart students will just interpolate, but uh, we do encourage them to actually do the measurements so they can talk about sources of error. Once they do this, you have all the information you need to measure both luminosity distance and cosmological redshift. It all depends on two quantities. How far was the galaxy when it emitted the light? And we showed that in yellow, this is at least approximately correct. And how far is the galaxy now? The light traveled something in between those two. And so we have them for the galaxies, grab the D thens and the D nows. The D nows is just this bottom row. And they put them in this separate table. Uh, here we ask them the question, is this universe expanding at a constant rate? Yes. Okay, they put their D thens there, the D nows here. You see the D nows are larger because the light traveled as the universe was expanding. So it traveled some distance intermediate to the two. And the actual expression is quite complicated, depends on omega matter, omega lambda, but uh, it's good enough for this lab. You could just kind of average the two. Uh, it's kind of halfway between the two is close enough. And that's called the coordinate distance. If you had a ruler as, as the photon was traveling and you, you were like ruler end over end measuring the distance it traveled, that's the coordinate distance. But what we actually, in this experiment, since they have the godlike powers, they are measuring coordinate distances. They have rulers that can expand, that can stretch across the entire universe. In reality, we don't have that. We use standard candles. And so we measure not these coordinate distances, but luminosity distances. And there's a correction factor. To get from a coordinate distance to a luminosity distance, you have to multiply by its one plus V, which is actually D now over D then. Here's the way you could just tell them it's a correction factor and leave it alone. Or if you want to, if they ask why you want to explain it, think of the light train, the photons coming at you. As the universe expands, this train of light gets stretched out. So the photons are stretched out. So you're going to receive them more slowly. So it will appear fainter. And so you will conclude it's farther away. Luminosity distances are bigger than coordinate distances for that reason. There's the spreading out of the energy, time dilation effect. So they multiply by the correction factor, they have their luminosity distances, okay? That's the x-axis. To get the red shifts, and they, they put those here, their luminosity distances go here. To get the red shifts, cosmological redshift just says the wavelength is expanding with the universe. So the, the wavelength is proportional to the size of the universe. So here's our equation for redshift, d now minus d then over d then. And so, Lambda then, I'm sorry, lambda now minus lambda then over lambda then. Lambda then just proportional to D then. Lambda now is just proportional to D now. Substituting that in, the constants cancel. So the cosmological redshift is just D now minus D then over D then. So from the simple things they measured, the D nows and the D thens, they can get both their X axis and their Y axis. 
and plot it up. And here I've actually measured off the rubber band. So it's not perfect because it's actual measurements. And there's Hubble's law, cosmological redshift, luminosity distance, linear. And so do we find that all the gap, you know, in an expanding universe, this is not motion through space. This is just the expansion of space, carrying things apart and it yields Hubble's law. And so we see Hubble's law and it's telling us, oh, it's the expansion of space that does this. Okay. And then again, if you're not careful, they'll skip over procedure C because it looks so tiny and they're focused here on procedure D. Okay. Procedure C, we just repeat, the rest will go pretty fast. So it'll only take a couple minutes. Procedure C, we repeat this, but do all of our measurements from galaxy two. And so here are the distances and all the distances are positive because even though on a rubber band, there may be a plus and a minus side in space, there's no plus or minus. And so they get their D thens, they get their D nows, they go through the same exercise. Now it's galaxy two that's zero and they, um, they plot it up. There's a tool um, called dual. Uh, it's one of the plotting tools. Now, they've already learned how to use the curve tool, which is many y values for a single x. But we also have a dual where you have different x's, different x-y combos, and that's what they'll need for this. And they can plot their, the Hubble constant they got from Galaxy 1. Sorry, the Hubble law they got from Galaxy 1. Here's the Hubble law they got from Galaxy 2. Uh, it doesn't go out as far because you only have three galaxies on one side of you instead of four, but they clearly match up. And the point is, it doesn't matter where you're doing this from. Everyone is measuring Hubble's law. Everyone sees all the galaxies moving from them. So can we claim to be at the unique center of the expansion? No. And lastly, they do a decelerating and accelerating universe. So here's decelerating. Again, they plot up the distance between galaxy one and five versus time. And they, they also overplot the constant rate from before. So in the decelerating universe, it started out faster and slowed down to the current rate of expansion. So a little different. This is indeed a decelerating universe. And they measure their D thens and their D nows, go through this and they get this as their Hubble constant, their Hubble law. Uh, here's the constant universe. And here's the decelerating one, it curves upwards. And it makes sense, because think of it, at great distances that corresponds to a long time ago, higher redshifts means higher speed. So in the past it was going faster and it decelerated down to the current expansion rate. And this is what everyone thought. Everyone thought the universe would be decelerating. We don't know what caused the initial expansion, but all the mass and energy would gravitationally try to work against it slowing it down, pulling things back together. So it curves up at high redshifts at large distances. And then we do an accelerating universe. Here it starts out slow and accelerates to the current rate of expansion. They do their D nows and D thens and they find that it comes in low. In other words, in the past, the expansion was slower and has since accelerated. And then this is the end. We just hit them with the type 1a supernova data. Uh, we don't tell them which is which. We just say the middle one's constant expansion. They look at the data and they learned about measuring distances with type 1a's back in lab five. They've learned how to do cosmological redshifts here. And most of the galaxies, sorry, yeah, and most of the type 1a, which are each in a different galaxy, are riding low. Hubble's law curves down. That means we live not in a decelerating, but in to everyone's surprise, almost everyone's surprise, an accelerating universe. It didn't surprise inflationary theorists because they knew omega matter plus omega lambda was one from inflationary theory. So they expected there to be a large cosmological constant. And it didn't surprise people who dated globular clusters because they were coming up with ages that were older than the universe unless you had a cosmological constant. So with the cosmological constant, you start with slow expansion, and so it takes longer to ramp up to the current speed. Oh, you can come in, come in. Yeah, yep, totally fine. Oh, this is Wednesday. This is the Wednesday meeting. No, it's not the Wednesday meeting, but we continue to call the comments. Okay, come on up. I, I'm one minute from finishing. So, uh, and so they conclude accelerating universe, 
they do a little bit of uh, Wikipedia research on dark energy and um, sources of error, accuracy with which the pins can be placed is a natural source of error, accuracy measuring the distances between the stretched dots. So, you know, as you stretch it out, the dots stretch. You can still centroid them really well, though. Um, stuff they sometimes say, I count, though I don't believe, that rubber bands stretch differently as they warm up. Yeah, they'll stretch more easily, but that doesn't mean they're going to stretch nonlinearly. And um, rubber bands do not always stretch uniformly. If it's a poorly made rubber band, I can see that, but these are all pretty uniform thickness. Still, I count those as valid sources of error. So that's it. So sorry for running a little over. I was dilly-dallying at the beginning as I was trying to wake my brain up. And um, Quick question. Please. Um, so this means that the uh, galaxies, uh, objects, between those, there is a space where there is no gravitational field, right? Because they are yeah, very, weak. very far. It's very there, far. but it's weak because they're far. That there, there are far, and then that is just the space. Yeah, we can just, say that is just the space, and with the, no, no dark matter, no nothing. Yep, that's the. In in reality, um, it's not so clean. Uh, the the voids between the galaxy do have some matter, etc. But you know, you have the concentrations in the galaxies and the dark matter halos around them. So the zeroth order, yeah, you have points with nothing in between. Uh, in reality, it's a little more complicated. But that's the basic idea. Oh, great. The, the, the Thank you. big concentrations Thank you. are too far apart for gravity to win. It's just the expanding space is doing this. And this will then all tie into Lab 9. This is setting them up for Lab 9 to really understand what they're measuring. Great. Okay. Appreciate it. Sure. My pleasure. Sorry for going over. Ian, anything else? Uh, no, sir. I was just hanging in there till the end. Okay. I'll see you in two weeks with the new lab where the students will measure Hubble's constant. Good travels. Have fun at Green Bank. I love that place too. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye.